Hello, everybody. You hear me? Dr. Dewey, Shlonik. I'm Dr. Fadila from Kuwait. It's nice meeting you again. Saeed, I am I'm, I'm very honored that you are uh, tuning here. Allah yakhalik, we are sad. Inshallah, we will be able to learn today. Inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. Islam. Allah yakhalik. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the platform of the Islamic World Academy of Science here in headquarters in Amman. As you are aware, food security is an important issue that contributes to the stability and peace in human societies. The advent of COVID-19 further highlighted the importance of this issue since it affects freight and restrict movements. Even some countries opt to hoard food and medicine for their national needs. Today, we are pleased to have Dr. Mahmoud Dwari with us to give presentation on the importance of this issue. Dr. Adwari is a higher education, government policy and agricultural science expert and leader with more than 45 years experience leading national and international institutions. He is an expert in enhancing food security and strengthening work on water, food, and environment nexus. The introduction of precision agriculture to the Middle East region and improve agricultural higher education curricula to meet further needs. He got his PhD from the University of Wisconsin, USA in plant breeding and plant genetics in 1973. Dr. Dwery was a faculty member of the Faculty of Agriculture University of Jordan during the period 1973 until September 2016. He was appointed as the Minister of Agriculture in Jordan President of Ajlon National University, Director Plant Protection and Production and Protection Division Food FAO of the United Nations Rome, Italy. He is also on many boards and member of national and international community co committees as, as such. He is member of the Food Security Group of the Arab Organization for Agricultural Development from 2003 to 2008. Member of the International Assessment of Agricultural Knowledge, Science and Technology for Development, International Agricultural Assessment from 2005 to 2008. And he is recipient of fellowship of international food system from 86 to 1989. He's an expert in the research of food security. Over to you, Dr. Dwery, please. Good morning, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Al Musa, and thanks to the Academy for hosting me this important uh, to speak on an important subject in our important era of the world. Uh, about food security, I think this reminds me of my graduate studies in the University of Wisconsin, when in 1971, when Dr. Norman Borlaug was awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace for the 1970. We were also, as graduate students, as a staff <coughs> and more, we were at that time very pleasant and happy about this important prize 
because it really represents the efforts of the world led by Norman Borlaug for what has been known later as the Green Revolution. Uh, through my life, we have witnessed the change in the definition of the food security term. The first definition, the first definition was defined in the 1974 World Food Summit. And it defined the food security as availability at all times of adequate world food supplies of basic foodstuffs to sustain a steady expansion of food consumption and to offset the fluctuation in production and the prices and the prices. <clears throat> FAO really has dominated the era of food security. And the definition in 1983 was expanded its concept to include securing access by vulnerable people to available surplus, implying that attention should be balanced between the demand and supply side of the food security equation. It ensured that all people at all times have both physical and economic access to the basic food that they need. In 1986, there was a global report, the poverty and hunger, <coughs> poverty and hunger, which focused on the temporal dynamics of food insecurity. It introduced the widely accepted distinction between chronic food insecurity associated with the problem of continuing or structural poverty and low incomes. Access of all people at all times to enough food for an active and healthy life. By simplicity and was not itself as a goal, but an intermediate set of action that contribute to an active, healthy life. The mid-1990s, <clears throat> food recognized a significant concern spanning a spectrum from the individual <clears throat> to the global level. The 1994 Human Development Report promoted the construct of a human security, including a number of component aspects <clears throat> of which food security was only one. And in 1996, there was the Food Summit adopted a still more complex definition. For me, this is an important day <clears throat> since I joined to be a member of the staff of FAO as director of the plant production and the production division in that year. Food security, the definition is food security at the individual, household, national, regional, and the global levels when all peoples at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutrition food to meet their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. This definition is again defined in the state of food insecurity 2001. And the food security is a situation that exists when all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and the nutrient food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. This new emphasis on consumption, the demand side, and the issues of access by vulnerable to food. And now the definition Food security exists when all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food, which meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. Household food security <clears throat> is the application of this concept to the family level with individuals within household as the focus of concern. 
and food insecurity exist when people do not have adequate physical, social, or economic access to food as defined earlier. Let me just remind you, people now use almost more than 200 definitions of food security. But I think we have to stick to this important definition for clarity and for helping us to work toward the goal to have a food secure world. And therefore, from this definition, we have four pillars. These are the availability. Okay, is the supply of food adequate? Access, can people obtain the food they need? Utilization, do people have enough intake of nutrients and stability? Can people access food at all times? I think having reviewed maybe the definition, we can also see the milestones. We have in 19, I mean, for activities, the global activities, which affected the food security issue. In 1974, as I mentioned earlier, we had the World Food Conference convened in Rome in 1974. And in this, I repeat that every man, woman, and child has the right to be free from hunger and malnutrition and set the goal of eradicating hunger in the world. And then an important activity in 1975, in, in 1979, is the World Food Day established in the occasion of Pau 20th General Conference held in November 1979. The first World Food Day was celebrated in, in 1981. Tomorrow, October 16, is the celebration of the World Food Day also. <clears throat> of significant is the creation of the FAO staff. It used to be known as AgroStat, and then this is a FAO stat. The FAO stat is an important because it provides cross-sectional data relating to food and agriculture, as well as time series for some 200 countries. And then in 1982, it, 1992, there was the first international conference on nutrition. And in 1996, we have the Rome Declaration on World Food Security and World Food Submit Plan of Action. And in 1996 also, <clears throat> there was a meeting in Leipzig on the plant genetic resources and the importance of plant genetic resources for food security will come at a later stage here in this seminar or in this lecture. Okay, paving the way for the importance of genetic resources, there was later the giving the importance of the animal genetic resources in the food security area. And then the Millennium Development Goals, Millennium Development Goal one aims at eradicating extreme poverty and hunger. And in 2000, <clears throat> in, in this, in 2000, we have three targets respectively, which read, have between 1990 and 2015, the proportion of people where income is less than $1.25 a day achieve full and productive employment and decent work for all. And in 2002, we have the report of the World Food Summit in five years, and I had the honor to represent the Kingdom of Jordan in that meeting. The World Food Summit plus five <coughs> adopted a declaration calling on the international community to fulfill the pledge made at the origi original World Food Summit in 1996 to reduce the number of hungry people, about 400 million by 2015. In 2009, the United Nations 
Secretary General, high level, he established a high level task force on food and the nutrition security. And in that, in 2012, we have a declaration, a future we want. Then the member states also acknowledge the food security and the nutrition has becoming a pressing global challenge. At TREO, plus 20 UN Secretary General Zero Hunger Challenge was launched in order to call on governments, civil societies, fair communities, the private sector, and the research institution to unite to end hunger and eliminate the worst forms of malnutrition. In 2014, the second international conference on nutrition took place at FAO headquarters in Rome. And in 2019, <clears throat> the 74th, this is an important aspect of food security, and I will dwell more and more on this. <clears throat> the, uh, the 74th United, United Nations General Assembly, they designated the 29th September as the International Day of Awareness of food loss and waste, recognizing the fundamental role that sustainable food production plays in promoting food security and the nutrition. I will be speaking later on the importance of cutting or decreasing or lowering the food waste and its important on food, secret, sec, uh, on food security. Uh, when we are talking about food security, we talk about important uh, crops. And this table, the first table, it shows the most important stable foods in the world. Maize is almost, yes, maize is 19.5%. Rice is 16.5. Wheat is 15%. Cassava is 2.6. Soybeans, 2.1. Potatoes, 1.7. Sorghum, 1.2. Sweet potato, 0.6, yam, 0.4, plantain is 0.3. These are the most important stable foods. Later, again, in this seminar, we will talk about maybe we have to introduce a new crops into, or to add a new crops, which we want to secure for food security. In the next table, Shows the largest food exports by country. <clears throat> you will note that the United States is number one, which export about 72 billion worth. Germany, 34, United Kingdom, 29, China, 25, France, 24, Netherlands, 23, Japan, 22. Canada 22, Belgium 15, and Italy is 14. Next table shows the world's best country in food security. Singapore, Ireland, But let us go to Singapore is the most food secure country with its seasons, citizens having access to safe and the nutritious food at affordable prices. However, Singapore imports 90% of the food it consumes and produce a mere 10%. 
a low population and high per capita income helps food access. This is food security. Let me just maybe I should have said this earlier. Food security is different than food self-sufficiency. I think in early 70s, uh, we used to say, well, OK, we, we need self-sufficiency. But look here that a country which imports about 90 percent of its food is only I mean, is number one in food security. Ireland, Ireland produces a vast majority of what it consumes. The secrets of feeding its population lies in the adoption of technology and in food production, the diversification of agriculture and established network of food distribution and an improving per capita income. Large scale production ensures efficiency and sustainability in the agriculture sector, while suction trade for all year around promotes consistent use of available land. Well, somebody may think then how we can improve the food security in a country is some of these, but of course, some of these important factors. The United States and the United Kingdom, they really come number three and four. And then the Netherlands is number five. Australia is number six. Switzerland is seven, Finland eight, Canada nine, and 10 France. Well, okay, since this maybe seminar concerned mostly the Arab and the Muslim countries, you see that the these 10 countries, none of them uh, really uh, fit in the, in the category to be in the number 10. In the next, Turkey, we have, okay, number 10. Okay, please, number 10, go back, please. Okay, this is the best country for food security. But again, for food production, okay. Next table. Next table is the performance of top 15 countries on their 2019 FAO food security. Here in this table, okay, I really uh, expanded than the normal thing, which we say, okay, 10 most, 10, 10, et cetera. So we want to see if we can include any of the Muslim countries, okay. So for the performance of top countries on their 2019 uh, food security score, Look here is the country you will find that again we listed the 10 countries. Qatar becomes number 13. And in the overall score, it is 81, then Denmark, and then Belgium. Okay, we said what are the pillars of food security, affordability, availability, equality, and safety. <coughs> and we have when we make this score really we are talking about these scores and this will give us the overall score when we have to take in consideration affordability, availability and equality. Okay, what about the Muslim countries? Performance of the top five Muslim countries based on, okay, the first country is, the, is Qatar, of course, then followed by the United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Oman, Kazakhstan, Bahrain, Azerbaijan, Egypt, Morocco, Indonesia, Jordan, and Tunisia. These are the 50. But as I mentioned before, Qatar is the only one which tops at least the 50, the 15 countries. This shows that the Arab countries the Muslim countries, the developing countries, they have to do a lot of effort. They have to do 
a lot of effort in to try to maintain uh, the to maintain a better a better performance in the food security. Now, when we are talking about okay, we know about okay. However, let us finish from the, there is a table, there is a graph here. There is a graph because we, uh, this graph shows, you know, if we go to the 1970, 72, and the global here, the global wheat production from 2011, 2012 to 2019, 20. Uh, okay, it started about 492. And then it reached about six, about close to 700 million tons of wheat. So there is a significant increase. But if we go, this is not present in this table. This is not present in this table. If we go to the 70, when I was just telling you, and when the whole concept of food security has been developed, we have less than 400 million metric tons. This shows the amount of contribution or the amount of increase in the production. The last year, okay, estimated the production <clears throat> in the 2020 is 758 million metric tons. Okay, so this is, I mean, okay, we keep, we keep as agriculturists, we are proud, you know, to see that we are doing a good job. The job is to increase the food production to really to respond to, th to the food security. And we will, when we look, uh, what are the challenges which are facing the food security? Why though we have this increase? Why though we have this increase in the tons, in the cereal crops, in the major crops, in the new crops, in the animal production. What is happening? Okay, I think, you know, we should, these challenges which are facing us for, they are the rising population, rising population. Rising population, there will be 2,000, 20,000, 220,000 people at dinner table tonight who were not there last night many of them with empty plates. So there is the increasing population. What else? There is rising incomes, changing diets. Today with incomes rising fast in emerging economies, there are at least three billion people moving up the food chain toward westernized diets. They consume more grain intensive livestock and poultry products. So. Okay, again, if those people just keep, you know, eating the cereals, et cetera, then maybe we uh, may not have a food security problem, but they are really moving to a new diet. Today, the growth in wild grain consumption is concentrated in China. It is adding over 8 million people per year, but the big driver is the rising influence of its nearly 1.4 billion people. And in, as income goes up, people tend to eat more meat. China's meat consumption per person is still, is still only half that of the United States. That leaves a huge potential for huge demand. <clears throat> okay, falling water table. I'm not going really to see how the Green Revolution has really cause the increase in the food production. Of course, you know, many people claim that, okay, because we use more water, we use more fertilizer, <laughs> we use more pesticides, etc. But okay, the Green Revolution has saved millions of people. Okay, okay, falling water tables is a challenge. In India, some 190 million people are being fed with the grain produced by over pumping groundwater. For China, the number is 130 million. Aquifer depletion now threatens harvest 
in the big three grain producers, China, India, and the United States, that together produce half of the world's half grain. The question is not whether water shortage will affect the future harvest in these countries, but rather what they will do soon. You know, here in Jordan, let me just, we also, again, we are lacking the water and we are using the water aquifers to produce more agricultural crops. And we know the results of using more water, what is going to affect. So the using more water and, and irrigation for the major food crops may really cause some of the problems. As we say then, since there is water shortage, there is a slowing in irrigation. Water supply is now the principal constraint on efforts to expand world food production. But during the half of the 20th century, the world's irrigated area expanded from some 250 million acres in 1950 to roughly 700 million in 2000. And it's almost now 1 billion. Okay, this near tripling the world irrigation within 50 years was historically unique. Since then, the growth of irrigation has come to a near, near standstill. There is increase <clears throat> in soil erosion. And I am glad, you know, to know or to read that even the World Food Prize has been granted to some soil scientists. So not many of us would recognize that soil scientists, soil is important for food production. I mean, we take this for granted, but soil is very important in the food production. And therefore, the increasing soil erosion is causing a problem. So therefore, we can say that nearly a third of the world's crop land is now losing topsoil. And the climate change, well, as I always say, the climate change, it is really a fact. And therefore, climate change is affecting food security. The Arab, the Muslim countries, the developing countries, every country has really to take care of the climate change and respond to this. One important thing you remember, okay, is what we call flattening yields. Why? Okay, and therefore, the Green Revolution, again, I go back to the Green Revolution. We have a great increase in yields due to the Green Revolution, use of pesticide, use of fertilizers, use of a new developed varieties. Now I think we, we are coming to a slower increase. And there's that is what we call, it is a flattening yield. Therefore, we have really to find uh, that we have to come up with a new technologies and new varieties which can make a new jumps to really take care of this flattening yield. Very important <clears throat> topic, as I saw in the, in, the, in the past, is really the food waste. I think we have ignored the importance of food waste. And as we have mentioned, that in 1970, in, in the year 2009, the 74th, I mean, I want to talk about this important factor now and maybe a little more also in the presentation. Because I think I, again, I want to say, I want to emphasize this aspect. And we in the Muslim countries, in the developing countries, everywhere in the world, we really need to take care of this aspect. I go back and say that in the 74th United Nations General Assembly, designed 26, 27 September as the International Day of Awareness of Food Loss and Waste. 
recognizing the fundamental role that sustainable food production fail, plays in promoting food security and nutrition. And September 29th, the International Day of Awareness for Food Loss and Worse highlights need for global food system reform. We say approximately 14% of food produced for human consumption is lost each year between the stage where it is grown to raised up to when it, it reached the wholesale market. 14%, 15%. We are not taking the, okay, the other food chains. More, more food is wasted at the retail food and consumer stages. Why is it important? It is important because when food is lost or wasted, all the resources that were used to produce this food, including water, land, energy, labor, and capital, go to the waste. In addition, the disposable of food loss and waste in landfills leads to greenhouse gas emissions contributing to climate change. Actions are required to globally and locally to maximize the use, the use of food we produce. The introduction, okay, how we can reduce the food waste. The introduction of technologies, innovative solutions, including, including e-commerce, platforms for marketing, retraceable mobile food processing system, and new ways of working and good practices to manage food quality and reduce food loss. And we are key to implementing this transformative change. <clears throat> Reducing food loss and waste requires the attention and action of all, from food producers to food supply chain stakeholders to food industries, retailers, and consumers. Let me repeat again, and that this will come in the conclusion also. I think in my lecture, Dr. Al Musa and others, if we really come out from this lecture and we are convinced that in our countries, we have to give more attention to reducing waste, food waste, I think we can improve the food security. In my country, in Jordan, when I go to the supermarket, big supermarket, <clears throat> unfortunately, you will see it is really hard to pick good fruits. At, at least, you know, because Dr. Al Musa in the introduction, I, he said that I was a fellow for the for the Kellogg Foundation Fellowship for Food Systems. When we went into, into tours, we visited the different supermarkets to see how these countries or how these supermarkets really dealt with the food. Unfortunately, <clears throat> not many supermarkets, not many shops, they really give you good uh, product. And I wonder what happened, what happened to the food wasted or the vegetables and the fruits at the end of the day. If it were given to the poor people, Oh, that is fine. We want to be sure that this is given to the, poor, to the poor people. And if this is given to the poor people, or it is also being processed, this is a good step. So food system, if I come out from this lecture and we have more public awareness <laughs> of producing food say this is really good for our food security. Let me just, uh, okay, give some key messages, and these are from the international organization. There is no room for food loss, we are saying, and waste in this time of, is a crisis, of crisis. The COVID-19 pandemic is a wake-up call to rethink the way in which we produce, handle, and waste our food. Reducing food losses and waste it provides a, soup, a powerful means to strengthen our food system. Innovation technologies and infrastructures are critical to increasing the efficiency of food system and to reducing food losses and waste. 
Public interventions should seek to facilitate in investment in food losses and waste reduction by private sector, especially at this critical time. Innovative business models with the participation of the private sector need to be shaped and the new approaches are needed to finance them. I hope that some of our university professors are watching or reading or will be reading and more efforts on research on food security and more efforts on reduction of food waste in any of the Arab and the Muslim countries should really take a place. I, I, I have more on the food because I really, I think this is an important topic. And there was a celebration of the food uh, and organization on the 29th of September about the cutting of the food uh, sector. Uh, now uh, we are, okay. now, now I want, uh, I wanted to speak about the COVID, COVID risk to the global food security. The COVID pandemic, okay, I will read it. The COVID pandemic progresses. Trade-offs have emerged between the need to contain the virus and to avoid disastrous economic and food security crisis that hunts the world poor and hungry most. <clears throat> Although no, no major food shortage have emerged as yet, agriculture and food markets are facing disruption because of labor shortage created by restriction on movement of people and shifts in food demand resulting from closure of restaurants and schools as well as from income losses. Export restrictions imposed by some countries have disrupted the trade flows for stable food, such as wheat and rices. The pandemic is affecting the four pillars. The pandemic is affecting the availability, the access, the utilization, and the stability. COVID-19 is most directly and severely impacting access to food, even through impacts, though impacts are also filtered through disruption to availability. Uh, okay, now I want to make, since time is running short, I want to make some key messages. Food security during the health crisis. It is critical that agriculture inputs, farms, food processing and distribution are declared essential and exempted from lockdown measures so that food can flow in adequate amount from farm to fork. Health protocols are needed to protect workers in food chain and help contain COVID-19. Incentives and support for transport and logistics, including deliveries to needy areas and for the sick are also important. Second, COVID-19 has highlighted the importance of early detection of a new infectious disease, 70% of which have their source in animals. Improving surveillance system for zoonotic disease arising from animals used in this food chain is vitally important for avoiding a future catastrophe. Okay, so far, we have globally, there was an over reliance on few stable crop. We named them maize, maize, wheat, rice has resulted in limited, limited diversity of, di of diet, a leading cause of persistent malnutrition. Nowadays, and that is in FAO and in plant genetic resources, the global plan of action of genet plant genetic resources that neglected crops or orphan crops could be global solution for food insecurity. Crop diversification, 
for the solution for each of these problems. And with thousands of largely and tap food species, the possibilities are vast. We have also to maintain the biodiversity and benefit from it. And gladly, <clears throat> I think, you know, we have, I mean, last week I'm talking about the UN airport. There was the celebration of the Biodiversity Day. <clears throat> and let us see that our world and the developing countries use more of the biodiversity crops and animals and food system. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any Okay, thank you, Dr. Dwery, for this uh, nice presentation in which you highlighted <coughs> many important issues on uh, food availability and food production and the alarming issue of food waste, where 14 percent <coughs> had been wasted from uh, along the food chain supply. And you connected these items and things to the United Nations Millennium Development Goals and Sustainable Development Goals. And you touch on the food security and the catastrophic crisis. <clears throat> now we can entertain some questions and probably there are some questions coming to the chat. Could you? I can see you them. Have see them. Okay. You want me to this is them. this is one question from Hina Jaffe. Um, Hina Jaffe. Yeah, yeah. In. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. From Hina Jaffe. This question. <clears throat> the question is from Hina Jaffe. Uh, okay, on an individual level, how can we contribute to food waste management? I think this is, a, thank you very much. This is a very important question. I think every time, if I understand well, we go to the grocery shop, to the shop where we want to shop, don't buy more than your needs are. Or if you them, if bring them, you have to store them well, and you have to be sure that you are using them. <clears throat> you are okay. I think here, I mean, let us take Jordan. As a developing country, people go, of course, the large families, sometimes the small families, they go and buy tomatoes, buy uh, box, uh, egg plants, etc. We have to inform, to be sure that this is not going to, some of it is not going to be used. And the garbage can, the garbage, uh, uh, it ends up in the garbage. Therefore, this is one reason we should not use more than what we can consume. This is happening at the house, old levels. Uh, you buy, okay, I'm not against cucumbers. I like cucumbers, but in Jordan, you buy two, three kilo for people, two, three uh, member families, and they don't maybe eat them at the end of the week. They are uh, not usable, and you end up uh, throwing them or not using them, etc. I think the same with the grapes, the same with tomato, etc. Therefore, you have either when you want to buy them, you have to store them and you have to use them. This is very important factor. Uh, a bread, okay. I mean, I have a graduate student who did a bread, a, a, a weed. Uh, waste in Jordan. We found that it is up from the seed till the fork, till the mouth, that about 30% of the wheat in Jordan is lost. Of course, you may say, okay, this goes to the sheep, this goes to the goat. This is not a true always. And you remember in Ramadan, I mean, if you are living in a Muslim country, you see that there are tons of food is going to the waste. Okay, there's a lot of money going into this and the government has to take care about how to treat this waste, how to move it, et cetera, et cetera. Therefore, at the individual level, thank you very much. I think awareness at the individual 
is very important. I hope that each TV station, you know, they have ad every day to the, to the household people not to purchase more than you need. Look now, during the COVID, okay, when you have lockdown, okay, lockdown, uh, you will see that many people purchasing the wheat, the bread, and maybe after two days they are throwing the bread and they are throwing the vegetables. And they are, this is really, it is, it is an important aspect where we have to really take care of the waste. And I think, thank you very much for the question. Okay, please, yeah, if you allow yeah. them to speak, maybe. Yeah, yeah, can, can you allow them to speak? Yes, you can, can uh, allow speak them to speak. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Much better. Yes. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to speak? Just raise your hand. Yes, Reza. Reza. Okay, well, thank you, Your Excellency, for uh, this fruitful uh, presentation. And actually, you targeted main subjects, which I think now we have to be very careful, especially after the COVID-19 pandemic. But what I would like to uh, here focus a little bit, you know, today, we are focusing a lot on smart agriculture, we are focusing on ICT utilization in agriculture. And at the same time, we are talking about small farmers at a huge scale, especially in the uh, developed countries. But how can we manage really the use of smart agriculture, ICT applications? At the same time, we are dealing with the small farmers who are really a big part of the situation in the developing countries, especially in our countries here in the Middle East and in most of the Islamic countries. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Shibli and Your Excellency. Excellency, well, uh, you know, we always find excuses for not doing things. Mm -hmm. Learning and teaching is not, uh, it takes time and we have to start. We have to start. When these telephones started, we did not know how to use them. Some people, they use them for every aspect of life. Farmers have to be empowered to use the new technology. And again, you say, since you use the smart, they are also smart. We have to teach them that an extension agent, I don't know, okay, to make it simple, should not visit him. He can communicate with him. You can put the information for him and he can get it, you know. People, we have to empower, empower those people by giving the information and by providing them by the different uh, technologies and tools to really use this. Uh, Thank you. If you yes. allow me, I, I have to respond to Dr. Reza's question. I think digitizing food supply chain is very important for small farmers given the fact that this will make availability of a lot of information for them and it can cut on the trans transaction costs as well. So but, but the thing which has been raised by Dr. Dwayne is that we need really a training, training and awareness programs should be taken by the public sector to train the farmers, small farmers, how to get into the sphere of uh, digitization. So I think it is of benefit. And we need, of course, a national system for information to, to gather the information from the farmers, from uh, all stakeholders in the food supply chain. Thank you. Well, let Hello? me just, let me dwell Hello? on this Hello? thing. It, let Hello? me dwell on this thing. In 2000, in the year 2000, when I became Minister of Agriculture and I came back from FAO, when I wanted uh, some technical assistance from FAO, the Director General told me, if I want to help you, this is 2000 years ago, this is 20 years ago, if I want to help your country and you have been an employee here, we have to, to improve 
your information system in the Ministry, the Ministry of Agriculture. I hope you know the people, the policymakers in the Ministry of Agriculture. I hope the Prime Minister listens to this, that in 2000, we were given uh, assistance from a few to form a, an information technology in the Ministry of Agriculture. Inform okay, my lecture is based mostly on information from FAO. Therefore, I think we want to emphasize that we want information, information, and information. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hello. It's Professor Oscar from France. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please. You know, I, it's a very interesting talk, but I wanted to I wanted to point out the things which are fight which are fighting against the food security. That's uh, we have a problem of fresh water which we need, and fresh water is decreasing all the time. And second is the desertification. The, the, we are losing more and more land into the deserts. And third one is the, with, because of the climate problems, the heat problem, which is affecting the, the yield of the crops. And the fourth point is the new diseases which are coming up, which are very dangerous for the, for the food production. There are, four, there are four points which are fighting <laughs> against the food security in the, in the world. So we have to take care of all of them. There are four points which I've raised, which are fighting very strongly against the food security in the world. What is being done there? Can you say something on that? Well, okay, thank you very much. And now, uh, if you are the diseases, uh, you are talking about the major food crops, the, yes, Rust, yes. the, the global Rust Initiative, the Global Rust Initiative, which is uh, by summit and by the CGR systems and by USDA agriculture, is really they have the early warning about the rust about the rust systems, and this is also true for the new diseases. So the, rust is the, one of the major problems facing the food security or the wheat food security. So there is, there is an international effort for that. About the desertification, of course, we have climate change. We, un we understand there's a climate change. And we have the CGR, they work more and more, you know, to really, and the national programs to find varieties and to reduce the use of varieties which are suitable for increase in temperature, for decrease of water, etc. This is this is a true, but the yield level is not going to be high. We understand we have limitations. We have limitation in these water, which is important. We have to come up with the new plants. Maybe there are new plants which can. Okay, we have we have ignored at the national level in the our countries, which mostly uh, uh, dry areas in the Muslim countries and the Arab countries, to really utilize the existing plants which can stand the high temperature, which can stand the dry, dry conditions. We understand that the if you don't provide the optimum conditions, you have to decrease yield. But we have ignore the use of the plant genetic resources. And that is why <clears throat> plant and animal genetic resources are important factors. And they are one of the best ways really, which are going to respond to the calamities or the new problems also raising in the new future. That is why we have to take care <clears throat> of the gene banks to increase that their each country or region, they have to have gene bank for this factor. So can, can I, I, can I respond hello? to Dr. Azra? Hello. Can I, can I, can I say what, what is being done in Jordan about that? What is being done in Jordan about that? 
What what is being what is being in, done in Jordan about that? For these four factors which I put down, what what are you doing for this in Jordan itself? Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> let me tell you, they are expanding. That is why the Ministry of Water, you know, they emphasize that water is not being used in the in the desert of Jordan unless it is very profitable. Unless I mean, th this is a, this is something important. We have to to really the priority number one for water is for uh, drinking water. For drinking, it is it is not for agriculture. Activity. I'm talking about the fresh water, fresh water, fresh, fresh water. The fresh water, the, yes, <clears throat> the fresh water, that is the underground. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it is the underground water. And the in the Jordan Valley, we are producing, I mean, it is the greenhouse, what we call the greenhouse of the area, of this area. It is being used, you know, uh, by building dams. And these dams, we are using uh, new technologies this is okay, but I think you know, you uh, we have to look at why we have these plants in the desert. They are living. <laughs> and can we take them? Can we utilize the genetic resources from the deserts and to to take the genes and have them into plants which can are edible? Thank you very much. I would like to contribute <coughs> to the discussion which Dr. Azhar have raised. And I would say that, yes, true, uh, agriculture globally is consuming 70% of fresh water. However, the, this and, and along with the three other factors, climate change, uh, desertification, and eruption of disease could be handled if we encourage and entertain viable, uh, uh, very good, efficient biodiversity. And this could be done by restoration of the ecosystem and reservation of ecosystems and using suitable varieties that can really tolerate drought, drought and could uh, be resistant to pests and diseases. Thank you. Can, can I ask? Can I? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dewey, for your talk, and thank uh, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Al Musa. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, I just want to highlight um, there is a need for increasing investment in bioeconomy. Uh, innovations and uh, using gene editing technologies in uh, like CRISPR, Cas9 in our bleed, breeding uh, research in research institutions and academic institutions in our regions. I believe this we are lacking and we are missing this opportunity to contribute in the food security in the region. Uh, the other word they are using and they are ahead of us. Uh, and I think this will contribute also to mitigate the climate change and compact diseases and the draw in the region. Thank you so much. I think we have to start at least from one point, you have to start, but we are not starting yet in these technologies and bioeconomy innovations uh, until now. Thank you, Dr. Duere. Uh, well, I think I, I, I completely agree with you uh, and with the Professor Askar, you know, of course. Uh, but this, what, this approach, we, you say we have not started. I think we have to start. Of course, this is up to the scientific institutions. And as I said, okay, you are now working with NCARE. Uh, I hope that you start this. I hope you know that the faculties of agriculture and the faculty of sciences start this. But, you know, we want, as we say in Arabic, we want to put something on fire. We know that, you know, something wrong is happening. Something is wrong happening. Right. And uh, uh, we, we really have to stop that. Well, there's yeah, a question. You. 
Yes. There is a question from Dr. Fatima Bani Khalid. She asked, how is climate change having an impact on food security crisis? Well, uh, simply what about, I mean, the climate change. <clears throat> now, we say, okay, we need water to grow plants. We, okay, so if the rainfall is decreasing, this is going to affect our lives. This is going to affect the yield of the crops. If the temperature is rising, this is going to affect the crops. And as Mr. Nair said, we, we need, you know, we need to start a new, tech, a new scientific programs. We have, this, this is a fact that climate change is happening, but you cannot really do a few things. I mean, the adaptations, there are some adaptations in the crop itself, in the animal itself, this is going, <clears throat> this is going to take time. But we have to find crop methodologies, I mean planting methodologies, to, to cope, to cope with the climate change. You have to grow crops which can stand the drought, you have to grow crops which stand heat, etc. Well, we have a question from uh, His Excellency Dr. Adnan Badra. <clears throat> Yes. Yes. Uh, well, I want to thank uh, the speaker, Dr. Dwery, for a very uh, interesting uh, lecture about uh, food security. Uh, my comments here, I think after COVID-19, we have to redefine food security. I think the food security which was addressed today is the one we used to, to hear it from the food organizations, the, from FAO, FAO, and others, uh, about increasing the yield of agricultural products, particularly cereals. I think when uh, we look at the data introduced by Professor Dewey. Uh, today, for example, he cited Singapore as number one in the world in food security uh, excellence. He, when he came to the Arab world, he cited Emirates and Qatar as the first states in the Arab world. Well, we know that Singapore has no water, and we know that Singapore has no agricultural land. It's a rock. It's built, and most of the land is taken from the sea. So what do we mean here by food security? It means the purchasing power of Singapore, that they have a purchasing power where they can buy anything for their food security. This is one. Also, Emirates and Qatar, because of the oil and the gas, they have extra, what you call, huge wealth that they can afford to buy any type of food anywhere from the world. This is number one. Two, also that Singapore and Qatar and Emirates, they can store food. They can build silos for wheat. They can build the storages for meat, for uh, everything. For, uh, and, uh, and this storage capacity gives them the power of food security. But let me remind you, COVID-19 has introduced a new item in food security, that when you have a COVID-19, you have a corona, there is no transport in the world. Transportation will stop. Communication will stop. And this is where we have to redefine food security under corona. What does it mean we define it? It means that we have to really become self-reliant, self-independent, and producing the basic thing we need in case of luck down, in case of luck in uh, the geography, in case of stopping geography and demography from nation to nation, from state to state. And this is why we come to entrepreneurship. We come to biotechnology. We come to genetic engineering. This is the new science now. 
in agriculture. Agriculture becomes uh, 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 something has to redo uh, uh, research in it, uh, in uh, introducing new cultivars. For example, uh, the use of uh, hydroponic. Hydroponic on the roof of one building, you can produce a lot of food from hydroponic and doesn't use water. 95% of the water is recycled uh, uh, among the roots. You have to aerate it and have the nutrients, the nutrients is right there uh, to introduce it. And you can produce, uh, by the way, 10 times, 10 times in the area by using uh, vertical agriculture, uh, by using hydroponic, particularly in uh, fresh produce. In fresh produce, uh, you have the aquaponic. Uh, uh, culture of fish. You can produce fish per 1,000 square meter, uh, huge amount, tons of fish by using uh, a biotechnology. So I, I feel that really we have to introduce new item after COVID-19. Uh, the item that countries should really introduce genetic engineering, biotechnology, uh, aquaponic, uh, aeroponic and hydroponic cultures uh, to produce a lot of food by cultures. Japan is doing it. Singapore is doing it. Malaysia is doing it. Finland right now is doing it. And, uh, and many uh, countries, particularly seafood, is produced from cultures. A lot of about tonnage. Uh, we cannot just go into traditional ways and means in agriculture, this is one. Second thing, uh, I, you remember uh, where we had some people in the 70s and uh, 80s when they said that China and India will be starved to death because of their increased population and no enough food to feed them. Well, science has produced uh, the, the contrary, uh, uh, through the centers which uh, was mentioned by Professor Dewey, the sea jars, the yeah, Summit Center produced the Mexica wheat, which is uh, really, we tried it in Jordan, but this is, uh, uh, you need water. Uh, one acre uh, of Mexica wheat produced four tons per acre, four tons per acre, Why in Jordan, usually because we are in semi-arid zone, uh, one acre pr maximum production is one ton per acre. By, by using Mexica, uh, the production was four tons uh, per acre, but again, irrigated wheat, uh, which was introduced uh, in Jordan. So, so I think uh, really uh, going into new breeding, breeding, and uh, uh, introducing new cultivar, uh, which require less water and produce uh, high yield uh, and also resistant to, uh, to pathogens, to pathogens is uh, also one way uh, for researchers uh, to do as quickly as possible. Uh, I like what Dr. Dwery said about the post-harvest loss, post-harvest loss, post-harvest geology. I think he's correct. 25 to 40%, I know that, 25 to 40% of food produced, they are lost through harvesting, uh, handling, uh, packaging, storage, and uh, in the market, in the supermarket and so forth, before it reaches to the consumer. I think something we have to take care of. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. There is no other questions. Oh, you want to? Yeah. Well, uh, thank you, Your Excellency Professor Bedran. Very interesting ideas, but I really, <coughs> it, uh, it is uh, here. When we started, you, you were also a graduate student. We were talking about self-reliance, self by producing, but we have to realize that no, but no country, I mean, a small countries can be self-reliance on the, pro the production of foods. This is important. But the COVID, you know, I did not make this clearly. 
The COVID disrupted the food chain. This is the most important, the, 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 this is the most important thing that COVID disrupted the food chain. And this is another, I spoke about food waste. This is another point I want to make that governments have to really look at the food chains and see that food chains are not disrupted. They have to take care of the workers. They have to take care of the transport. They have to take care of everything. Science can solve the problems, but I think there is no one country which can be dependent. We, we can't be dependent. And that is where we went wrong many times when we said we want reliance. But we want to build science and technology. <clears throat> and we all in Jordan and the world appreciate the remark of Professor Bedran. And he is strongly fighting for building a scientific, scientific base in Jordan. The scientific base, it is unfortunate that we have not produced good results from science. I hope that there is, that, that there will be a, a meeting on how we can maybe use science for our needs in this country. And agriculture is important. I, I appreciate your points and I think they are worth, but they, they, I appreciate, you know, we started the projects when <laughs> you were uh, also the Secretary General of the Science and Technology uh, Society uh, about biotechnology. You know, it is unfortunate that nothing has resulted. This is in Jordan and this is also in Arab countries. We really need somebody like you, somebody like you to be pushing and to really take the leadership as usual with your success project. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll take the last question from Dr. Azhar. Dr. Azhar, go ahead, please. No, I, I just wanted to talk about um, the artificial rain which has been organized in Jordan and that to decrease the amount of fresh water from, from the rain. And I know that they have uh, these scientific, scientific systems in Jordan, they have uh, increased the rain, amount of rain about 20 to 30% per, 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 every year. And that's a good addition. Could you say anything about this, this means being used in Jordan? Uh, unfortunately, I don't really know about it. Uh, somebody from the audience. Uh, well, I think uh, by law, I think, and even by custom, uh, custom Jordanians have their cistern structure yes, yes. over over uh, the buildings, and they might have some uh, reservoirs under their buildings as well. So this sort of compensate for the shortage of water when the water is cut off because not. We don't have available water, running water, all the, all the week. So this will compensate. No, he is asking. He is asking about increasing rainfall. You know, there are there are technologies. Anyway, yeah. in the in the Badia yeah. or in the desert, we have been success, no, successful. Technology, technology which is being used in Jordan, as far as I can understand, has increased the amount of rain on the average about 20 to 30 percent in, in the country. And these, uh, are, these are, you know. There was a, a trial. Maybe Dr. Bedran knows. Dr. Or Dr. Awes. Dr. 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 Yes, uh, uh, hello, everybody. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Dwery, for a great, uh, great talk. and. Uh, I think this subject is timely, uh, not only because of uh, changes uh, in, uh, in the politics around the world, but also because of the COVID and because of the climate change. Uh, I, I have a comment, but I'd like to respond to Dr. Azgar regarding uh, rain, uh, rain uh, simulation and rain uh, uh, en enhancement. And there was uh, uh, several trials in Jordan uh, 
uh, to uh, stimulate train. And uh, uh, there was uh, promising uh, results, but uh, we still don't have uh, solid, uh, yeah, solid methodologies and processes uh, to do because uh, we still don't have good indicators on whether the materials and the in, in interventions they cause increase in rain or not. There was increases in rain at times when they fly these flights and do putting the materials and things, but uh, uh, they, they didn't have enough uh, indicators to make sure that this is due to that. Uh, because there, you know, the, 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 the number of trials and the number of replications and the uh, number of observations are not enough to uh, ensure that uh, that the, the 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 materials done are the reason. It's just like now the medicines for the COVID. They give them, but they don't know if the improvement is due to them or not. Uh, they, they say, well, this requires a lot of bigger studies. But I think they are still doing that. But I have another comment uh, uh, regarding the, the the topic, which uh, Dr. Dwery rightfully indicate that. Uh, the, 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 the concept of self-sufficiency and self-reliance may not be uh, uh, suitable, especially uh, in countries where we have a shortage of water. And uh, we know that uh, we can increase production with water available, with this little water, as uh, Professor Vedran indicated, by improving technologies and things like that. But we are talking here about the globe and uh, and uh, the food security, the major things on food security are associated with cereals and uh, legumes and uh, uh, nutrient, uh, other nutrient things. And uh, here the hydroponics and the others we talk are good for improving vegetables and this cash crops. And, uh, but we, we still in Jordan cannot cover the uh, food uh, security elements regarding cereals, legumes, and major meat and other things uh, because of we have shortage of water. Uh, it's not, I, I, I don't think the problem is shortage of land, uh, but it's shortage of technologies. And I think the, the technologies can utilize the land much better than now, even without going vertically in, uh, in, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, hydroponics and others, we still way behind in utilizing technologies in greenhouse, normal greenhouses in the Jordan Valley, for example, and other uh, and other places. But we still, this would not solve the issue of food security. And uh, uh, it, 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 in the world actually produce enough food. In fact, uh, he was right in indicating that we are losing about 30, 35% of, of the food waste. Uh, and there is surplus in the world. The problem is, the distribution and the affordability. The poor countries cannot buy the food when they want to buy it. They can't because they can't afford it. Uh, uh, plus there are lots of restrictions. Jordan is in good shape compared to other countries on the Muslim countries and the developing countries. We are 60, 60 on the scale, uh, but there are 200 countries or more. So, we still have problem in distribution of food, in, uh, in the relationships between countries, in securing that food security is about. There are commitments from the United Nations. There are commitments on, that we are seeing the world is going into isolation. They are going, in the last years, countries are becoming unilateral uh, relations. They are worrying about themselves internally. And there are sanctions everywhere. Politics is used to prevent countries from getting fertilizers, getting uh, other things. Uh, there, are, there are lots of problems in the world where this food doesn't go to about 25% or 30% of the people, including people in this, in this, uh, in this region. So how, how this can be overcome is not by increasing only production. I mean, I'm for increasing production internally because that helps, but that doesn't solve the problem. Jordan imports 80 or 90% of its cereals. We, if, if we put all the water of Jordan 
to produce wheat will not, we will not produce 10% of Jordan consumption or 20%. So this is, this is no way. So do we improve food security by, for example, increasing our storage? You remember in 2008, when Qatar, with all the money they have, they could not buy wheat at any cost because the wheat was not available in the market. The, 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 there are crises where the money doesn't make. So here, for example, the storage for security for years is one solution and the local reliance. The reliance is that you produce when you need to produce. You don't need to use the water every year to produce things and uh, where you can buy it cheaper, but you can produce it when you need to produce it that you cannot import it and you cannot buy it. That's my understanding of the self-reliance. So we need to, uh, to put together a strategy and each country to put strategy to for food security includes improving local production, but storage and relationships where they can get the, the food when, uh, when they need. My last point is that there are still, we are still using indicators for food security, which Dr. Guerri indicated, which is consumption of meat. And the way we talk about uh, China and India that they consume half of the West consumption. This indicator is not any more friendly uh, to both water and the environment. The Climate Change Convention uh, discourages consumption of meat because meat, uh, animals, uh, the more we have, the more methane gases and the more contribution to climate change. Animals contribute 20% to climate change. So people in the Climate Change Convention discourage uh, uh, increased consumption of meat, not, not, to, not to consume wheat, meat, but less meat consumption is better for health and it's better for the environment. So the indicator as meat consumption may not be any more uh, friendly uh, to the environment and to, uh, to, to, other, to other places. Thank you very much. That was very nice uh, talk, Dr. Berry. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, participation in this uh, vibrant discussion about a very important issue. And I would like to invite all of you to the next session that will be uh, uh, under the title of the debate on future strategies to cope with agricultural water scarcity and climate change. It will be given by Dr. Lee Bawes on Thursday, the 5th of November, 2020. Thank you very much. I hope, we'll, hope we'll see you all. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Dr. Ali Musa, yes. we, thank you very much for we thank you very much for organizing this very interesting talk. This is the first time I hear that the IAS is, act is very active at present. Thank you very much for organizing this talk. And thank we you. hope we we'll have it more in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Azar. All, all the best. All the best to all of you. All the best from France. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, I really want to thank uh, my colleagues, you know, from the, uh, the listeners. Uh, I have learned a lot, but me, let me just uh, emphasize that uh, food security is a complex uh, and an important issue. There are, there are many factors, but uh, we also, in any country, there are comparative advantages. Uh, for Jordan, we can produce many crops, sell them, export them, be self-sufficient, and instead import the crops if they are available. But since, you know, I am glad, you know, to note that His Majesty the King is very important, is, I mean, has visited, the silos for food security, for wheat, for barley, for sugar, etc. 
This is very important. And this is the type of food security we take, is the storage, is the production, what is available in the international market, what is available in the internal market. We have really to improve the food channels, you know, for the food security issues. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> All the best. Bye-bye.